So now that we have created a node class, extended that into a game node class, into a ship class, and finally into a player ship class, it looks as if we have everything we need with the exception of some input handling to create some ships on the screen and then control them such that they move around. So how would we go about doing that? Well, actually, it's not quite as easy as it looks. Well, to be honest with you, it could be relatively easy, but we'd make a mess of things, and we're going to run into a very interesting snag. First thing, where are we going to put all of our input handling code? I know many of you are probably thinking, hey, let's just jump back over to the game class and put it inside its update method. That's a great place. And we have done that in the past with simpler examples. But now here we are creating a game slash game engine that all of the classes are very focused. We're not throwing any generalized code back over in the game class. We're keeping everything very specialized. So it doesn't seem to me that it would be a good idea to put any of our, um, any of our input handling code back over into the update class of the game. Well, suddenly our input method would start to get unnecessarily large yeah. while we delve back and forth between some nitty-gritty input handling and then some high-level systems like timers and nodes. And So let's just say for just a second we've done that. All right, excellent. So that means if we were going to have a couple of ships, we need to spawn some ships. So let's say we instantiate a couple of these player ships. So we have a list. I'm going to draw the list out horizontally, and you'll see why in just a second. So here we are with a list, and inside this list, let's say that we've created a red and a blue ship, and I'm just going to represent red as A and blue as B. All right? Now, obviously, the first ship is going to be controlled by... I don't know, player one, looking at my controller that I have in front of me right now, the center ring of lights that indicate player one, two, three, and four has player one lit up at the moment, and Logan's has player two lit up at the moment. So let's say here I am, player one, and I am referencing this first ship. Player two, Logan, he's referencing this blue ship. So far, everything is going great, and I've convinced Logan that for some odd reason that the game update method was an excellent place to put all of this uh, input handling code. So we're now controlling some ships. These ships are moving around the screen. We're having a good time, and I die. All right, that's not good. So what happens if I die? Well, we know that we need to remove the ship out of the player ship list. And this is being done, as well as out of the node list. And that's the key. It's being done automatically because of the architecture behind node. The node gets, gets removed when it dies. Game node specifies help, and the node goes away when it dies. So it's not something that we have to manage. It just happens. That's right. If your player ship, as a game node dies, it's gone. It's out of the list. It's also out of the main nodes list. So let's see what happens with our list. Since A just got removed... B is the only thing that's left. So if we were to refer to it, basically it's it's in slot zero, if you want to say that there were slots. But, I mean, it's the only thing that's in the list. But here's the interesting thing that's happened. I just kind of cheated in a way. I'm playing, Logan's playing, we're having a good time. I just got killed, but since I happen to be player one, I just took over Logan's ship the moment my ship got nuked out. Exactly. So the the control of the ship has been inherited. Now you're controlling my ship, and I have no ship left. Let's just say, for the sake of this example, um, say that having no ship doesn't cause the game to crash. Now, because I'm saying, it should explode right now. Well, let's say for some reason we had the necessary checks in place where the ship being gone doesn't actually crash the game. Now I'm sitting here, and I've got no ship. I'm controlling nothing. My ship has been inherited by you, <laughs> and you're continuing on the game, and now there's only one ship left, and everything has gotten weird. And now we're going to have to start figuring out how you can respawn a new ship, but just the fact that I've taken over your ship is problematic enough. And now let's say I'd, let's say maybe I'd found power-ups, upgraded the ship, done something to it, because it's, it's my ship. I've been taking care of it now. I don't have it anymore. <laughs> I do. So how are we going to go about combating this very unique issue, as well as moving all of the input handling code away from our game class into something more specialized? This is simple. What we're going to do is we're going to create a new class. This class is going to extend nobody. So he's just going to be sitting out there all by himself. And we're going to call this class player. And this really does make a lot of sense. It's not a player ship. 
it's a player as in me. I'm a player. And I need the ability to control my ship. Ah, that means I need some input type stuff and I need to own a ship as well. So what are going to be the responsibilities of my player class? My player class needs to, first of all, own a ship. Player class is also going to have a few static members in there that are going to help us solve some problems. The big one being this ship stealing scenario. We're going to fix that problem right away. And we're going to do this by maintaining a player's array inside of our player class. This is going to be a static array, and it's always going to exist while the game is running. So let me go ahead and just put maintain. Players Array, and we're going to talk a bit about this in just a second, and I'll demonstrate how it solves our problem. Also, inside here, we can handle our spawning and respawning of ships in the game. And then finally, this is where we can offload all of our input handling. So input handling. For all four ships, or you could say all four players. This is this is interesting. We're going to have this player class, and from this player class, we can instantiate our players. So here we are. We've got four players all having a good time. So each of these four players have instanced methods that can handle their own input stuff. So basically, we can take a look using the, the gamepad state and the keyboard state, and we can take a look using our player index and see, all right, what controls are being activated right now, take those into account to come up with the right information that's required for our ship to update properly. So there we go. We've just taken care of the individual input stuff. Now, we can create a static member that's just called process input. And then back over in the game class, we can just make one call. We can say, all right, it's during update time. Let's call process input inside of player. And then process input inside of player can turn around and say, let's loop through all of the instance players and let each of them handle processing their input. And with that, it's really fairly simple because that, like you said, it reduces it to a single call out in the game's update method. But inside a player, all it has to do is a simple loop through all players in the player's array and call the instance method for each individual player. That's right. This and is following uh, in the footsteps of the timer system. Or with the timer system, we could have a lot of different timers. But from inside the game update class, we just call the static timer update and then let it worry about calling or updating all of its timers. That are in the list. Exactly. It makes it very easy to read what the individual subsystems of the game are doing because we see them at a very high level when we look at them from the game class. So let's go ahead and set up our player list again, our player, excuse me, our player ship list. And now let's go ahead and bring this guy into the mix. So we need to maintain a static player's array. So we're going to have a static constructor. The static constructor will go ahead and initialize this array, boom, right there at the very beginning. So here is the array being drawn out. And the array will always have four elements. So there's our four elements. So first, guys, this is going to be player one, player two, player three, and player four. Of course, we know we're zero based, but this is really going to work out well for us because as we're working with our controllers, we know that our player index is also something that can be cast over to zero base. Exactly. The player index enumeration that's used to tell the difference between the four different games. Which is tags. generally one, two, three, four spelled out. But exactly, that's that's the key though. That one, two, three, four is actually spelled out in words. If you look up the definition of that enumeration, you'll see that the numerical values for those are zero based. You have zero, one, two, and three, which resolve directly into our arrays elements. There you go. So now in here we have only two states that we can ever have inside of our array. Our array is going to rather hold a null or it's going to hold 
some reference information, right, Logan? That's right. The, as a matter of fact, each of the elements are actually going to hold the instances of player that are used for input. Mm -hmm. And those players, in turn, will hold ships or will hold null. But like you're saying, if you look directly through that scenario, you can look at those four elements as referencing either null, pointing at no ships, or referencing a specific ship, indicating that, ah, we have a ship, and this is the ship that we have. That's right. So basically, inside these guys... We're looking at our actual player instances, and inside the player instance, each player must own a ship, Exactly. and that guy is pointing back out over here. But as Logan said, to kind of see through the data and simplify it, I'm simply going to show the array having a null or a reference to a specific ship. But just keep in mind what's really being stored in the array is our player instances. Okay, so let's say here I am, player one, and I am referencing A, and Logan's referencing B. This guy is going to have a null, and this guy is going to have a null. Now, all of the nulls are going to become very important in just a second. So here I am. And again, this is kind of a high-level graphical representation. I'm not actually pointing to the first index in a list. I'm, I'm here pointing out to A. A is going to be out here on the heap somewhere, and that is the object that represents our particular player ship. Okay, so again, just keep in mind, high-level drawing here. So here I am pointing to this guy. Logan's pointing to this guy. Everything's working great. Bam, I just got killed. Ah, so what happened when I died? Well, we already know what's going to take place here in the list. B is going to slide down this way. Now, somehow, this information right here needs to get changed. We know that the handling of our lists, our static lists for our player ships and for the nodes, all of that's done automatic for us now. It's all been set up. So it's going to get removed out with absolutely no problem. But somehow, when that got removed, I need to get a callback that's going to come back from player ship saying, hey, back over here in player, let's go ahead and take this array and that particular, whichever slot happened to hold a player that was referencing that ship, let's take that ship and set it to null. So a high-level drawing would indicate this guy having been just set to null. All right? Now, check this out. What's going to happen with who we're referencing? Well, our first guy is not referencing anybody no more. He's just got a null. The second guy, B, is still referencing B. So Logan continues to play. He's still referencing his ship. And now, since we're going to handle all of the input stuff inside of player, we can set it up to where when it's time for each of these guys to process their own input, we can check our states of the player ship. Are we referencing a player ship that exists, or are we referencing null? Because in the end, remember, high-level drawings, but that's what we're talking about, the player ship, because we must own a ship. Well, at the moment, I don't own a ship. It's null. So when we start writing the code for the input handling, we can simply say, all right, do we have a ship? No, we don't. It's null. Oh, well, if it's null, then the only thing I am interested for this particular player on their controller is that start button. Or if it's player number one and they're using a keyboard, I'm interested in the enter button. So I'm listening out for you to hit the start button. If you move your thumbsticks around or press any of the other buttons, I don't care. You don't own a ship. If you don't own a ship, you're not allowed to fly. In the story. So I listen out for the start button. Now, if I happen to detect you hit a start button, what am I going to do? I am going to instantiate a new player ship and I'm going to store the reference of it back in here. And by instantiating the new ship, what happens? He just got created in here. And since I'm storing that reference, I now have a ship that I can control, which means the next time back through for this guy's input processing, now if I'm moving around my thumbsticks, woohoo, I can control a ship that's moving around the screen because I now own a ship that I can move. So that's what we're going to set up in the next video when we create the player's class. We need to make sure that every instance can point to a player ship reference. That's very important. If it's a null, then we know that we're going to be looking out for a player hitting the start button or hitting the enter on the keyboard. And if they actually have a ship that we're pointing to, then everything is hooked up. And then we can start taking into account 
thumbstick movements. Okay, so that is going to be the primary goal. I think, just looking over the code real quick, I don't think there's anything here that you've never seen before. As a matter of fact, it's probably going to be a relatively boring video because we're going to get into the uh, process input stuff, and you guys have seen that. If key state dot is key down, keys up, then move this way or that way or this way or that way, or let's take our thumbstick, and if it's left, let's do this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is stuff that you guys have seen in the XNA 101 class. The interesting portion of the player class will be how the static methods maintain the players and the state of the players in the, in the list, or excuse me, in the static array. I will point one other thing out, and that is the fact that we will have four player instances that are set up to be able to handle ships or handle nulls, and those instances will never be removed. That's we'll right. have an array that never changes, that never gets uninitialized, and we'll also have our four players that never get destroyed. It's the players themselves that have the capacity to point to a ship or point to null. Again, I've and I've been uh, saying, so just let me reiterate for just a second, high-level drawing right here. And even the arrows, this isn't technically accurate. I'm just using it to show the references. But the array, here's the array. A static constructor in the player class will automatically create this at the very beginning. And when this is created, what we're going to get are four new players. So there's our four new players. Now, because of the way that initialization takes place when we instantiate a, uh, a new object, the player ship field that we're referencing inside are all null because we have not yet created player ships. Okay, so this is what is technically happening. This is an awesome representation right here of a high-level look at the relationship of player and player ship. It shows how the player ship, or excuse me, the player's array acts as a layer between the physical actual controllers one through four and the varying elements that exist inside the game's lists that hold actual ships. And we can show that with that as an intermediate layer, we can maintain the connections between player elements and actual controllers even though the position of those ships in actual lists might shift around or disappear and then have to reappear. That's right. That's our objective. By the end of the next video, we're going to go ahead and make sure that everything is in place so that we can spawn a couple of ships and then get those ships moving around so that I'll be able to control, Logan will be able to control uh, both by his controller or by keyboard, which means if you do by keyboard, I'm going to, well, yeah. Because the keyboard, interesting thing, and we'll demonstrate it in the next video, the keyboard, we're going to lock down the player one, period. If we don't lock the keyboard down, then the keyboard controls all four players equally. That's no fun. Tr trust me, I'm trying to play with a controller over here, and Logan can override me or at least battle me with the keyboard. Never, never any fun. Uh, let's see. Anything else we want to add to this? After the next video, we'll have one more video where we're going to take into account a different sprite sheet for each of the players that we can have so that by the end of the video, after the one we're doing next, uh, we all have different textures for all four players. So with that, if there's anything else you'd like to add, now's the time. Uh, nothing comes to mind. Again, just setting up a intermediate layer. We'll use the player class to maintain this layer and to maintain input. Again, it's not going to be a very exciting video coming up, so go ahead and grab yourself some coffee or a soda and just kind of get ready for some stuff you've seen over and over and over. With that, that's going to wrap up this video. Thank you very much for your time, and we'll see you in the next video.